Hello and welcome once more to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and today our guest is Byron Katie. Hi Katie. Hello Ian. And Katie is very well known for the work. She's written many books. I have a couple here. There is Loving What Is, Four Questions That Can Change Your Life. And there's a workbook called The Work of Byron Katie. And there's many more, so you can just check out what's available and what you feel drawn to. So there's a quote, Katie, I picked out of one of your books, which goes, it's very short, I am the one who knew nothing, one who awoke within the ancient wisdom. What does that mean to you now? Well, what does it mean to me now? Um, it sounds like I thought I knew something when I when it came out of my mouth, you know, ancient wisdom, I don't, yeah. um, I don't, I don't think there is any ancient wisdom and through inquiry, you know, um, just to end every thought in a question mark, every assumption in a question mark, um, ancient wisdom can't live very long. So it's, uh, it, leave the mind, it leaves the mind in that don't know place that is, just so vast and open and, and teachable and less I know. So I know when you were quite young from things I've read that you actually had some quite deep experiences. As one time you were three years old and you were sitting on the curb and you felt that all you could see was all that existed. Yes, and I would I would love to believe that every child, that, that everyone that gets still enough could identify that time. It was you know, just being still and witnessing, knowing that if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. And really, you know, looking back at that, or just from right here, right now, not knowing what anything is, is uh, left, you know, basically without comparison and a happy life in every moment. It's as if children do have this inherent wisdom within them and somehow as they get older and more conditioning mm. creeps in, then mm. that gets distorted, doesn't it? Yes, they become believers. And um, the life of a believer is very difficult, very confusing. Like some say it's black, some say it's white, some say up, down. You know, imagine for a child a clean slate, how confusing that must be. You know, you don't look down and say up, or people say you did it wrong and you don't know what wrong is. So now I am the one, you know, my identity develops out of that. Who am I? Well, I'm the one that does it wrong. And so all the I'm the one that looks down and and the one that did it wrong, and is that supposed to be up, or is it down, left, right? You know, it's, it's um, very confusing for the believer. You know, we feel that we never get it right, and uh, we're fairly accurate in that. It's all a projection of mind, so of course we're confused. We even think that, um, that, hmm, that there's a right way. And the way is always right. But what we're believing about the way, you know, that could use a little work. So that's what I do. I bring inquiry, the availability of inquiry to the world. And, and it's good for some, and, but it certainly takes a lot of silence, a lot of stillness, a lot of contemplation to sit in a question such as, is it true? After you've identified some assumption that is causing great disruption it's as if we have to go back in one way to being an innocent child. We have to rediscover that because there's no way out. We have our growing up and we get on, we get all the, the human conditioning from our culture and from our parents. And that's the way it is, isn't it? You know, it, it certainly was that way for me. And then when inquiry found me, it's like I just went back to where I came from, just one assumption, one concept, one belief at a time. And as identity fell away, it's, um, it's certainly, uh, I found the cause of, of and for a lot yes. of laughter. It's like I turned out to be the joke itself. Just, just, just to take just briefly your, your story in quotes in, in, um, in sequence. So 
you, you had a not particularly happy childhood and then you, you got married to your first husband. You obviously had some, somewhere inside you there was a real strong drive in the world because mm -hmm. you became with your husband very successful quite mm -hmm. quickly and uh, mm -hmm. there's a quote I pulled out of one of the books like money gushed up like oil. I'm not saying that's mm -hmm. your quote but someone yeah. said that about you. You became rich and powerful. You were living actually the American mm -hmm. dream but on the outside it was the American dream. Mm -hmm. On the inside you were hurting, weren't yes. you? Yes, yes. And you know if you if you um, if you have let's say financial security and it was not like vastly wealthy you know when you live in a small town it doesn't take much to be wealthy because that's you're comparing it to so it wasn't like major major wealth it was just comparative wealth but it's um, you know that's supposed to make you happy but it doesn't change what you're thinking and believing so rich or poor we're attached to what we're thinking and believing until that's questioned. I don't know another way of waking up to the dream world that we're living in, this, you know, this world of suffering, other than inquiry, I, um, which I did not have access to growing yes. up. The, a thought would happen, I would believe it, and I was identified, and, you know, and I would tell you that's true, and, and then defend it. And of course, you know, I've discovered that defense is the first act of war. So I was um, very confused, very confused. Had a lot to unlearn. But it's interesting you had this drive, and, uh, and not everybody has that. You had the mm -hmm. drive somehow to find, to complete, mm -hmm. and to discover. And that drive originally went on the outside because that's all you knew, and that's what mm -hmm. society was doing. Yes, it's, it's, it's as though. Um, I just knew what to do. It was clear. Yes. I just, I just knew what to do, and now I know. You know, um, there's a term I love. I'm not the doer, and so what I was believing um, was interfering with what was actually going on. Mm. And today, you know, more awake uh, to what's really going on without the addition of my story. What? An amazing apparent existence. Yeah. What 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 play this imagined world? Just to you know, this world where there's no, there's absolutely no um, cause for suffering. No cause for pain. It's a beautiful world to wake up to. So you became very overweight, alcoholic, smoking everything was going to the extreme. So something kind of had to give and it could have been, yeah, I guess. It's just like I played that one out. <laughs> yeah, you did, you that's what yeah, I, it was, that, that was my path and it, yes. was, it was a radical path. And I know I had dinner with Eckhart and Kim um, a few nights ago and um, we were, he at one point we were laughing and, and at one point he said, well, Katie's way is very radical. <laughs> But it was also total. <laughs> with a, with, a, with a great to, smile on that yeah, sweet face of his. There's, there, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make this point because I know there's a lot of people who watch Conscious TV who, okay, they're lost in their own way. They're, they're, they're trying to find a way. And there's something about this totality, which I loved about your, quotes, mm -hmm. story. And as, as we said, you did it, you did it completely. And then everything kind of crashed and you left your husband lost some money, you made some more money, mm. and then you were so desperate you ended up in what's in America called a halfway house. Yes. It's not a term we use in Europe. Yeah. And there you didn't even feel you were worthy to lie on a bed. Yes. So you yeah. were lying on the floor, mm. and then what happened? You were lying on the floor one day. Just talk me through what happened. Well, um, asleep on the floor, I woke up one morning. You know, I slept next to my bed because I Again, I didn't believe I was worthy of even that. But sleeping on the floor, I woke up just like we all do every morning. But I woke up in two ways. I woke up from the sleep of the night, and um, I woke up into another world. And, you know, it was quite radical. I, prior to that, I believed that you had to die of the physical body to escape 
this this hell as I perceived life to be. And it wasn't true. There's another way, you know. It's and, it's, and for me, it just turned out to be so simple. What I saw that was so valuable, what really matters on that experience is, is I saw in that moment that when I believed my thoughts, I suffered. And when I didn't believe my thoughts, I didn't suffer. And I've come to see that this is true for every human being. Now, it's all the darkness in that moment was gone. And I could see in that moment, in that, that unidentified I moment, I could see that the moment, I'll say it this way, the moment that the mind hit, it, it had lost the ability to believe, but it saw in that moment that the mind hit that what it believed, it saw. So it was the ultimate creator of all. And then this laughter that, that it, it's as though it just burst into life. And that was its first sound. And so I've experienced a lot of laughter since. That is, you know, I can look so serious, but that laughter, it doesn't move. It's just, it is the most brilliant thing to say, to hear someone say, for example, the sky is blue. And I can't laugh and say, are you still believing that, or are you are you just being funny? To it's just that 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 silent humor that's going on all the time, that laughter, and and to have lost the ability to believe, and in in that grace of of always being that. I am that, I am that, I am not, I am not. It seems, it seems to me the breakthrough was, and this is using your words at the time, from what I read anyway, that okay, the, a cockroach goes over your foot, mm -hmm. and there's a recognition that comes from somewhere that all is one. Yeah. Now that, I presume, didn't come from the mind, or not directly from the mind, well, but it went nothing via that, the mind. There's nothing that does not come from the mind. No story, no world. And how else are we going to tell it? And so, of course, we do the best we can. But yes, in that, I was, I, as I lay on the floor, uh, actually a cockroach crawled over my foot. And I opened my eyes, and in place of all that darkness was a joy. And I um, have always had difficulty speaking to that. I think it's better lived. Yeah, but, okay, what interests me is, and it's something that I think I can personalise to a degree, I didn't, haven't had a cockroach, mm -hmm. but it's like there's the realisation that everything is one. My language is more the ground of being rather than everything is one. And then the mind comes in, and when I say the mind, I mean the conditioned human mind, and it creates the separation. So let's, let, let's look at yours as symbolic rather than you personally, mm -hmm. Katie. So you're lying there, you have the cockroach. Mm -hmm. Realization comes from nowhere. Everything is one. And then the mind comes mm -hmm. in and says, well, that's a cockroach. That's my foot. This is my body. Mm -hmm. And that, in a way, and I think you identify yes. this in the work, yes. that's the beginning of the disease. That's the beginning of separation, yes. moving away from the knowing that everything is one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So... Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do a little bit on this, I, 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 and then, then, we'll, then we'll come much more broader and much more onto the work. But what, what I liked about your, your story was that you had to learn humanness. You had to learn to communicate. And I wondered, do you remember any of this process? Is it so far in the, in the, in the past now? How you were, uh, it's like there was a, seems to me, a learning of a new way of being a human being. Yes, because it was, um, you know, how do you identify when you don't? How do you be when you're yes. not? And I, um, I um, for example, maybe I would um, be walking and for an agoraphobic, that's a lot. And, and, you know, years locked in my own world and bedroom and home, so to speak, very difficult to leave. 
and very fearful. And, but then this experience, and then there is this apparent woman walking, and maybe I would um, maybe walk into someone's house knowing that it was mine because no one had told me that's not what we do here. And so I had this knowing, this understanding of no separation. So maybe I would sit down in, in their living room and the family would come by and say, hello, how are you? And the warmest, friendliest world. And then they would start figuring out that no one knew me in the family that I had, in fact, not been invited in by anyone that they could identify. And then they would began to teach me like this is our home well that's separation yes and then they would begin to teach me who they are can we help you how can you know what can we do for you would you like a glass of water what is your address you know these moments you learn you have an address that you're in the wrong home that's huge separation but i did meet the friendly universe starting this time from a child because i had inquiry to show me the way so in my original experience everything turned out not to be true and that hasn't changed for example maybe i would find myself in um in a in a maybe a mall or a marketplace and I would be just sobbing with just the miracle of it all just this this miracle and maybe I would sit down against the wall just out of people's way and people would stop and say may I help you the same thing again it's the heart you know and yes. would you like a tissue can I help you is there anywhere I could, is there someone I could call? I mean, over, that's what we hold in common specifically. Then if someone says, I'm going to kill you, isn't that a blessing as well? You know, once you understand that you cannot die, that you have to be born, you have to exist before you can die. You know, there's a little confusion here on the planet, but nothing inquiry can take care of if the mind is open to inquiry. And you know, we're, we're going to some uh, uh, amazing, um, experiences here on this planet we'll just I'll say it that way and we could use a little enlightenment a little inquiry you know, fear is um, is the opposite of of our true nature and for me true nature is basically I love I care how can I help? I mean, that is standard, just standard, the standard voice of the heart. And when the heart and the mind are same, that's the end of the duality of the, that you spoke to earlier. There is no longer duality. There is no apparent negative in that world. It cannot, it's, it's, it's meant to be humorous, nothing more than that but that is once something that's seen through only love did your mind and the old conditioning try to get back at all because the way mm -hmm. the way you're talking it's not only your realization of who you truly are mm -hmm. but there's also within that there's inherent trust and I'm wondering did the old try and get back the old doubting say what I'm doing may be dangerous. Through the world, through the world. They, for example, someone might say, you're crazy, you're dangerous, and it would excite me. You know, it's like, my goodness, where am I crazy? And where am I dangerous? And then just get still. And then through those images and concepts, you're shown. You're shown. And if it's not kind, it is dangerous. In, in other words, what I mean by that is, is there's this, this, this movement toward what is not our nature. Other than that, what is dangerous? Nothing. But you feel it. Everyone, everyone feels it. I mean, that's what stress is. That's what anger is. That's what anything that is that would go against our nature. This, this, caring heart, the heart. That's what anything that would argue 
with that kind of beauty is going to feel like stress. And we have names for it, like anger, hurt, sorrow, and um, resentment, anything like that. But those are just emotions to let us know, ah, you know, don't look out there to change the world, to be more comfortable. Look here, look here, identify what you're believing and put it to the test, put it through, you know, put it through inquiry and then you may come out a little lighter or possibly a lot lighter. So your doubt completely went because a lot of this mm -hmm. comes from doubt. Did that, that, is that totally eliminated? It's eliminated through inquiry. Anyone, so can, a child can yeah. see that when their okay. mind is open to and questioning. Did, when you, I, I know, I say I know from what I've read, with the work, you understood the importance of the work because it was partly when you were in the halfway house, you did some healing to people mm -hmm. and you saw they reverted back because psychologically, mind-wise, they still had the same program and you mm -hmm. saw the work as a very important tool for them changing the mind. Yes, to, to break the spell. Yes. You know, if someone says, don't believe this, okay, okay. Okay, I'll try, 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 try. I won't believe it. I'll. So then you have to go into denial not to believe it because you still believe it. So inquiry is the only thing I know to break the spell. We can see something very beautiful, but the mind, it won't last long. To the unquestioned mind, it will tear it to shreds. You know, it, will, it will do whatever it takes to keep its false identity. That's how it works. It's just, for me, every thought is the beloved. For me, every thought is, is like a child that hasn't been met with understanding, met by the heart yet. So maybe it says uh, something terrible is going to happen. You know, if you just put that through inquiry, that is a child's mind that says there's anything here that would harm. And that's a little radical, <laughs> as I've been told. That's a little radical, but not in my world. It's not radical at all. We could, you know, look, look at us. We could use a little... We could l use a, a little help with the mind. It seems to be a runaway train, and we only need look at the, let's say, the outside world and the wars in the world and the famine and the, the fear to know that somehow the one mind could use a little help. Anyway, with every, every, every apparent person in the world, if you put all of those bodies together actually, just drop the bodies, you have one mind, one schizophrenic mind. So when, when there's one, let's say, enlightened mind, it begins to shift everything, and it just begins, and there are a lot of wonderful minds, um, as I see something like your program, waking up to a little reality. Is there something in you that has consciously maintained this vigilance of inquiry, or is it such a natural automatic process now? It's, it's, um, it's, is it true has just come alive. It's a part of mind. You know, let, that mind says, uh, let's say, using that prior example, something terrible is going to happen. And then over here there is complete wisdom. No one holds more than another. It's, it's total, it's complete. But it's the same mind, you know, and, and then let's say in the center, is, there's, is it true? Like something terrible is going to happen. And if, if that same mind asks, is it true, and just waits, then this will penetrate, enlighten it, wake it up, wake, wake it up. But that's what's so important about stillness, about just being still and listening and to contemplate on, is it true? Is, it's very powerful. It ends internal Velcro. And that is true attachment. You know, attachment falls away. Mind is safe, to use your word, in releasing what it believed. And in that fourth question, who would I be without it? You begin to notice that <laughs> you're okay. And there's no moment that you have never been until finally you begin to understand that not this. There's nothing to protect here, nothing to secure, to make comfortable or to move into a pleasurable situation, a fearful situation. You see, I would challenge you there because I don't know whether it's an understanding or a grace of God. It's as if on the level 
of working on the mind and working with your mm -hmm. questions, yes, the layers get peeled away, automatically they fall away, and yes, somehow there's a letting go that happens. Yes. But like when you, happen, when you woke up, most people when they really wake up to who they truly are, there's something quantum. It's like God, quote, smiled for a moment. Yes. And you can do all this work and somehow and it improves your life it takes away a lot of the automatic programs, but something doesn't necessarily happen automatically. Would you say I'm being cynical there? Or? No, no. It just certainly seems that way. I see every mind as the enlightened mind, and I see uh, the mind very confused as it identifies, trying to uh, stay identified as something that it's not, and it has to be completely vigilant. And again, the only thing I know to break the spell is just to get still and identify what, what mind is believing in the moment and then put it through inquiry and then see what's left. Because I, I work with, you know, there are millions of people in inquiry and, and as well as in this inquiry, these four questions, that, whose lives are shifting. And for me, that's waking up to reality. It's um, uh, the, the mind's ability through inquiry eventually to, again, use your word, just to trust that I am not this. And without this, there's nothing to lose. It is just mind's play. And that is, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. But you see, does it really work that way, yeah. that I and not this, because again, my experience is that actually this is something completely different. I can never say I'm not this. Something happens when you realize that, ah, in my words, I'm the ground of being, yeah. not this. And it's the, you know, the I, it becomes this narrow circle sometimes in my life, the I, and people maybe call it the observer, the witness, mm -hmm. but the observer and the witness it's never going to let go because it can't because it's the one it's trying to let go of. Mm. Somehow something happens and mm. I am this, which is completely different. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can see it, but um, I am this once it's questioned. You can't have that either. You know, mine cannot exist as something because it is nothing. If you take all the thoughts that have ever been thought and you put them in a big, box in front of you and you look in there, there's nothing. So Mine the questions cannot ever be. So the questions ultimately destroy the mind or destroy the thinking, the irrational thinking process of the mind. They would say that it's something. And once it can no longer believe it, it just, for example, on most people have had thoughts like these. I want my body to be young and beautiful and healthy and flexible, and you just feel that, and they yeah, take it to yeah. the gym, okay? Or I want my mind, my thinking, my thoughts to be young and healthy and beautiful and flexible. Which would you choose? Everyone chooses the mind. Yes. Because if you were paralyzed from head to, to toe and you love everything you think, where's the problem? There isn't one. So that's another way of saying, I am not this. Someone says, I'm going to kill you, find it hilarious. I mean, yeah. what are they going to kill? And that happened to you. I was listening to uh, a CD, which is one of your books, mm -hmm. I think, and someone, I think they held a gun to you, is that right? Yes, he said he was going to, to kill me, and he pulled the hammer back, and, and I looked into his eyes, and I thought, you know, I'd want to kill me too if I believed what he believed, how could I not? So he's a believer, he's not guilty. I mean, we can't stop ourselves from believing what we're believing, that's what inquiry is for. In time, it enlightens the mind, um, or not, depending on how open the mind is, because even that is a state of grace. But he said he was going, and I thought, you know, he will or he won't, don't know. And in the meantime, I could see the sky and the clouds and the moon. Did your heart beat faster? Eyes. Did anything happen at all? No. You know, everything is what it is. Yeah. And it is so entirely beautiful. I mean, what is going to die? And if I'm dead, how would I know it? I mean, I, 
You just, there's nothing born to die. It, it's just, and my thought was, I hope, as I looked into his beautiful eyes, he was so frightened. And, you know, he was frightening him. He was about to, in his world, kill. Yeah. And, but my thought was, I hope he doesn't do that to him. But that's not something that people can understand, so I give him the gift of my silence, and that's a gift to myself. I am that, and that, and that, and not, and not, and not. So he did not pull the trigger, as far as I know. And if he did pull the trigger, um, where is the problem? You know, you wait. It hurts or it doesn't. For all you know, it won't. Let's say he did pull the trigger, you just wait, and it, if it doesn't hurt, you just go on. If it does hurt, you notice. And you notice that even pain is a projection of mind. Doesn't matter. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it hurts. That's an honest, that's honest. And yet, all pain is a projection of mind. So that, that ever noticing beauty of just now and not. You sound completely free. How would I know? You know, as far as I know, yes. And what do I know? What do I know? You know, when I tell my children, you know, in all truth and humor, you can't have anything. And isn't that a lighthearted thing to be? Mm. Or to not have? Is doing the dishes still your meditation? Yes, and everything is everything is that. Yeah. It's yeah. every everything is that. It's it's picking up the trash. It's 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 walking from here to there, even if it's just one step. Well, one thing that you that you talked about, which I read, I think it was a transcript, and I thought was was very useful, is about how you say no, because obviously you have to say no sometimes to people. Mm -hmm. And yet it seems to me an automatic process that you know to say no mm -hmm. or you know to be available and say yes. yes. Is it as simple as that? Well, it's, um, I only answered one thing. So yes, it is as simple to, as that. I don't contemplate what do they want me to say. They want me to say yes or they wouldn't really mind if I, there's none of that going on. I'm answering to one thing. If someone said, would you like to take a walk? Number one, how would I know? I haven't done the walk. You, know, you can't know the future. So I can't answer honestly. And so every reason to or not to do the walk is just a play of mind. So I answer out of this. If it's a yes, it's a yes to me. If I say no, it's a yes to me. So I always win. I'm always a yes to this, the center. And that is worthy of integrity. And this is an alignment with the whole, isn't with the it? Whole. It's yes. like you, like me, like everything is just yeah. a manifestation of the whole. I, I owe that. I owe that. I am that. But to me, they're different words. That I owe that, and I, that I am that. I understand completely. Mm -hmm. But I owe that implies debt. Well, it can be heard that way, but it would be like, another way of saying it was just being true to oneself, but it's beyond the self. Okay, so you say it as, to be t okay, I understand that, yeah. yeah. And why not? <laughs> How are your children now? Because I, what I found very moving was in, in one of the books I read, it had a lot of details mm -hmm. about what happened after let's say your awakening, and then I think it was R Roseanne was saying, your daughter was saying, mm -hmm. she didn't recognize you, you were a completely different person. And she found it hard at first. Yeah, it was very difficult for them. Because she, th she thought you'd resort to the old because you used mm -hmm. to have these primordial screams coming out. It was a rough old time for them. Yeah, rough old time for them. You know, um, for um, people witnessing this, this discussion, it's, it, it was an angry mother, a very confused mother, and um, just teaching my children what wasn't, 
because I, as a believer, believed, you know, the things out of my mouth were really true. And of course, I've come to see that I didn't believe them, that I really tried to believe that I believed them, that, because it's not possible for me, as far as I know, um, to see anyone as a believer. You know, and I invite everyone to get still and, 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 and test that. We, you know, the mind is continually just, just always attempting to identify itself as, you know, through believing that identity that they're in in the moment. So um, with my children, um, it is still difficult, you know, um, one of them especially um, still projects very heavily onto me but uh, he has every right to, every right to, and life of the believer. My job is to love. That's the simplest job in the world. You know, it just comes down to that. That meets my nature, the nature of everything, of these flowers and this glass. I mean, we couldn't count the, the, the blessings and the grace of this moment, you know, this dream. The work is inquiry is about waking us up when there's a nightmare. And people say, but Katie, you know, it's still just a dream. And it's, yeah, no dream, no world, no, no existence. And there isn't existence, but isn't it wonderful we can still dream it? Yeah, I think if I personalize it to a degree, kind of. if I personalize it to a degree, I would say that, and that's why I asked you about diligence earlier, it's like when things are going badly, then of course one inquires and it's pretty unintelligent not to inquire but it's just as important to inquire when things are going well oh, that's because amazing. that's when you learn even more yes yes and it and, and it that also can it just can shake one out of denial and denial is what holds unenlightenment holds a sleepness in place so inquiry wakes us up to what we already know that we didn't believe we knew. And in that, it can never be possible again because we, we have to believe it before we can see it, meaning anything. So it is, you know, for the believer, that's what brought them in, let's say at three or four years old or two or six or seven years old, you know, the, the first time a person believes is the moment of birth. It's, you know, as identity. So maybe someone's calling Ian, Ian, and certainly not calling you, you're in your own world. And then it, maybe some moment you look around and everyone's saying Ian, Ian, and, and then maybe you just, in that moment, you believe that's who you are. And prior to that, no Ian. In that moment, Ian, identified, mind identified as a something. So we really are, um, our birth is here, and our death is here, and our joy, and our, our fear, and our, our everything. This is it. This is the creator of, of all, without exception, in my um, experience. Do you still feel an affinity with homeless people? I know at one point you, 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 you thought you had to go out and spend time with homeless people. Is that still a special relationship? Well, actually, with people. With people, yeah. Yeah. And um, so, yes, yeah, still all people. Yes. All people. I guess, I guess all people are homeless in one way until they know who they are. You know, um, I, uh, that really feels right. It really feels right. but. But, you know, just people to be able to walk into their homes and know who they are or, or out on the streets with people that, that your mind may separate yourself from. You know, if you're not attached to what you believe about those people, then there is no separation. And you're at home everywhere with everyone in every situation without exception. And that's home. Yeah. Yeah. There's a quote, I, was, I, I pulled out quotes from some of your books, mm -hmm. and there's one here, I just got my finger, I just found actually, there is only one story, the story of the one. And that's what you're saying. It's just, 
one story and maybe there's a few tangents yeah. and a few different apparent endings, yeah. but it's one story. Yeah, the story of I doesn't go far. Yeah. It doesn't accomplish much. And really, we're all, I say we're all, virtually everybody is somehow so entangled with fear and anxiety. And I think from memory, you actually define fear for not getting what you want. Is that right? Is that how you see the... Fear is, you know, you can, can really sum it up with, with um, you're afraid you're going to lose what you have. It's threatened or you're not going to get what you want. Yes. And that's, that's, you know, because it implies that what we, what we have or don't have that we need Let's see, a simpler way of saying it is I have everything I need in every moment, but that's too limited. I have more than I need in every moment, and I have tested that one. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm very open to something different, but in almost 30 years, no exception. Yeah, you see, I think the way, what really happens is we look at it a little bit more that we're all trying to be happy. That's a very basic, mm. to feel complete, to feel mm. one. And somehow we look to the outside and think, mm. if I can have that or more of that or better relationship, whatever, mm. I'm going to be happy, which translates, I'm going to be complete. Mm. And of course, on the one, on the outside, we're, we're using mm. up all the resources rather quickly and it has to come back to here. Mm. And maybe mm. we get what we want to some degree on the outside, but because it's a natural expression of our connection with mm. the ground of being rather than us wanting it as separate individuals. And that, mm. for me, it's, it's the thing of, it is fear to some extent, but it's fear of not getting what I want in happiness. I think that's what it comes yeah. down to. Yeah. I guess it's a different for everybody it's, in the manifestation. Well, yeah. yeah, it's just certainly something to contemplate. But yeah. I think that, that you know, speaking to the state of grace that, that um, you brought up earlier, in this moment now, it is impossible not to have everything we need. And our mind would lead us to believe differently, but that has nothing to do with the state of grace and reality. It is simply something the mind, something to identify and question. Other than that, it's a perfect world, and I have really tested that. You know, it is a friendly universe. Yeah. It's interesting, I, I, in the last interview I had, it came up, I mentioned at the end about, I've been very moved recently by some um, autobiographies. I read a couple of people on death row who are, they know they're going to die, they're living in pretty awful conditions. They're caged up, and often the jailers mm. are not really nice, not very nice, and they get rubbish mm. food. And yet, unbelievably, or maybe unbelievably is the wrong word, but somehow they find peace in themselves. It's well, just it's no decision, no fear. It's that point where they don't have a choice. Their mind gets, oh, there's no way out. The end. So fear is, it, it, it happens any time you project a future, uh, even a nanosecond ahead. So, okay, gonna die. These bars have convinced this mind it's over. So it's over. There is no, so no decision, no fear. When the mind knows it's over, it yeah. rests. But they no identity to, to keep alive that it they, can they, hold on but to. But they haven't come from negativity. It's mm. somehow they might, the process might originally have come from resignation. But out of that, it seems, and I haven't met these people, but it seems there's an expansion there. There's, there's an acceptance, an expansion, and as you say, there's accepting what is now. And it's not even the process, it's not even accepting it, just no, there's, acceptance is there. You know, when there. the mind, when the mind uh, loses its ability to project, in other words, create the illusion of a future, it loses the ability to um, project, it's over. That's the end of fear. And in that space, it is huge because mind is, is infinite source and it is free to, 
to meet itself with understanding that is unlimited is so beautiful. So um, I would hope death row for everyone. Well, we're all in death row in one way. It's just that it's a funny thing with the human mind that you kind of know you're going to die, but you don't quite believe you're going to die. You think, well, until then, what can I do to make this better? And well, that, in and one way, is not a bad attitude yeah. to say. And I think you talk about that, that, that kind of the best way to deal with the fear of death is to relive. Mm -hmm. Because if you relive, there's something positive that comes out of it. Or be lived, I would say. Just, so back, just yeah. be lived. And be lived. And, um, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to move my hand. Okay, I did it. And then I have, do I have to take credit for everything? And without the stories of that, just amazing. No I. So we have to finish this part in about five minutes. Then we're going to have another short part where my colleague Eleanor Gilbert is going to actually run through some questions with you of some issues in her life. And so let's just end this with just talking briefly about your four questions. You want to run through the four mm -hmm. questions and how you and how you see those. Well, for example, using that um, that statement, something terrible is going to happen. And the first question. Is it true? The second question, can you absolutely know that it's true? That something terrible is going to happen? So whatever thought somebody has, they can apply the first two questions. They're very obvious, very simply. Yes, the work is a way to identify and then to question the thoughts that are the cause of all the suffering and confusion in the world. So there are only four of them. So the first one is, is it true? The second one, can you absolutely know that it's true? In this case, the concept we've identified is something terrible is going to happen. The third question, notice how you react and what happens when you believe that thought. So this is where all your emotions have the opportunity to be noticed and contemplated and witnessed, how you react when you believe that thought. And then all the actions that are born out of that and how the mind works. How do you react? What happens when you think that thought? So all four of these are, are questions to meditate on. Okay, fourth question, who or what would you be without the thought? And then I invite people to turn it around. Something terrible is going to happen. The opposite, something wonderful is going to happen. Well, it's not enough. So in the situation that you're considering, what is wonderful? And begin to, to identify something wonderful is going to happen. So you consider other options, and that's that quantum healing that you were sp uh, speaking to before the interview. And um, it, it's, it's all over the place in this inquiry when you find these opposites, turn the concept around and contemplate what is as truer, truer. And what you need to be, especially with the third question, is completely honest with yourself, don't you? And still. And you have to look and in the nooks and crannies to see what's there. Yes, and, and actually, you don't even have to look. Just listen. And it you will, you, and okay. it will that question and what meet it, meet it, will, and it will enlighten you. That's how it works. So really, the work is nothing. It's, a, it's, it's like a, a portal in. And then you just listen. Something terrible is going to happen. Is it true? Listen, be shown, and it, that power, that, that I know mind does not have a, an avenue to, that mind will enlighten you. So it's ask and wait. Be still. Ask and wait and be still. And know. And know. Yeah, be known. Yeah. Do you spend much time each day being still? Always still. Yeah, you're always still. Always still. So now you're still. Now I'm still. Immovably so. So you're rooted in stillness. Everyone is. But they f get covered up and they forget or they don't know. The believers, that's the life of a believer. Yeah. It's, it's, an, it's an illusion. Mm. Well, that is a wonderful place to end with the thought mm. or the knowledge, or even better than knowing, Everybody is rooted 
in stillness. So Baron Katie, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Wonderful to sit with you. I enjoyed our conversation, our meeting. I did as well. And if viewers want to stay for another 10, 15 minutes, there'll be a separate little exercise with Eleanor and Al, just showing a practical example of the four questions of, of the work. I'll just show again a couple of uh, Baron Katie's books, although there's many. If you look on the internet, you'll find many, but there's a couple. So thank you for watching Conscious TV, and I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. Hello and welcome back to Conscious TV. My name is Eleonora Gilbert and uh, I'm having the studio with me Byron Katie mm -hmm. and I'm really excited about doing a uh, actually an experiment or, or, or really an experience rather of the work that you do mm -hmm. worldwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is an issue that I would love to explore with you. So okay. this is uh, a great opportunity to do so, I think. Okay, okay so... Um, there are certain situations whereby uh, I feel that the deep belief that I have, even though on the one hand I know it's absolutely not true, on the other hand there is this, this thought this, that pops sometimes in my mind where I'm not lovable. And that really, really, really hurts because I know it's not true and yet there are certain situations where that like oof and I lose so you and you're, you're believing you're, believe you're believing that you're unlovable yes in that specific situation reinforces that mm -hmm. so um, you know for me those times are so precious because i can say on one hand i know that i'm lovable you know i know it's not true but life shows us what we believe and what we don't believe so you know it Conf it's a con confrontation with denial. So if I'm, say, let's say, experiencing your situation and I'm feeling unlovable, mm -hmm. that shows me that what is really true is I believe I'm unlovable. Yeah. And, and I'm saying one thing to people, yeah. and the truth is, I don't feel lovable. Okay, so that's what's such good news about that. I've just been enlightened to what I believe and what I don't believe. So now that we've identified it, we can get very still with this and contemplate on, um, you know, where is the, where is it that I'm not awake to this yet? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, or where is it that I'm not enlightened yet? Where am I still asleep? Yes. Okay. So in that situation, in that specific situation, and I invite you viewers to uh, find a situation of your own. So in that situation, you're not lovable. That person is seeing you as unlovable. Or is acting as if. So I... you are unlovable. Right. Yeah, that's what you are believing. Yes. You are unlovable. So in that situation, is it true? In that situation? Well, now, it certainly feels true in that now situation. Now, the, the, in inquiry, yes. You know, I talk about the old paradigm mm -hmm. where people used logic and conversation. Right. right. And we still had war on the planet, like yes. the dinosaur age. War with the self, war with the world. So then there's a new age, like inquiry, that can take us into a whole other paradigm. Yes. So the answer to the first two questions, there are only four, mm -hmm. the answer to the first two questions, you contemplate until you are shown the answer, which is one syllable, yes or no. Right. So if it's any answer, so any answer other than yes or no is the old way, right. where we had conversations. And so try just yes or no. Okay. And notice how the mind will go crazy. It wants to go, yeah, but, well, I know that, 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 you know, it, it'll, it'll dance. And then just notice, 
be very gentle, then, then just drop into stillness and be shown. So in that situation, and if you're at home, I invite you to close your eyes, and in that situation that you were experiencing, you're not lovable. Mm -hmm. Is that true? And remember, it's just one syllable, yes or no. And this isn't a, a, a trick question. Whatever it is for you, you know, just drop under that and under that and be shown, be still, wait. Am I unlovable? No. So an answer, the answer no, that authentic answer, if it's your, and some of you are answering yes, that's okay, and you would go to the second question, can you absolutely know that it's true? And we'll skip that, because your no will take us to question three. Okay. And these questions are always free on the work.com always free, never have to pay for it, it's, it's, it's there. So third question, notice how you react when you believe that thought in that situation. Notice what happens, so this gives you the opportunity to get in touch with your feelings, your emotions, and, and any embarrassment or anything, your shoulders or face, your facial expressions may so just go back and notice how did you react in that situation when you believed that thought? It feels devastating. It's, uh, it's as if I diminish, shrink. Um, it feels extremely young. Uh, but mostly it, it's, it's a pain like a stab in the heart. It really feels devastating. It's, 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 it's almost like the end of the world. It feels oh. that strongly. Yes. So now just kind of flow into this fourth question. In that situation, notice who you would be without the thought. I'm who unlovable. Would be, who would I be without the thought? Notice the difference. The mm. first thing that comes to mind is like I would have no excuses, like no more excuses. What does that mean? No more excuses to be small, no more excuses to fall into that small space, no more excuse to, to blame. To blame, yeah to blame other, whatever that is, whoever that is. Yeah. So now let's, let's move to the turnarounds. So you, um, are unlovable. What is the opposite of that? Lovable. So you are lovable. In that situation, give me an example of where you're lovable. Of where I am lovable. Where you, where you were actually lovable in that situation at that time. So what I love about, about inquiry is it gives us the opportunity to go back and witness what the thought we were believing, the concept we were believing, the assumption we were experiencing ourselves as, that identity, to see what was in that space. So to go back, take another look, I am lovable. So witness that situation and give me an example of where, in fact, you were lovable. Where I was lovable. In my kindness, in my generosity, in my helpfulness, in my presence, in my um, company, in oh, just being. And I have one. Would you like to hear it? Yes. In your innocence of believing in the face of, of the real and authentic, how you could see yourself as anything other than that. Yeah. That innocence that would believe 
the unreal that's really going on. Yeah. In the face of all the proof, that innocence of believing what would oppose it. Yeah. 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 We're all so innocent. I forget about that. Yeah. Well, and, and this really puts light on it because you really were innocently believing you were unlovable in the face of that person you just described through the examples of I am lovable. Mm -hmm. So you, in that situation, you were unlovable, is it true? No. 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 So now, when you think back to that situation or that person you were yes. with, yes. it's entirely changed. And an yes. appreciation and a compassion for oneself and and a reality of who and what you really are takes over because you have been enlightened to yourself, to that situation, to that other person, rather than asleep in it. Yes. Yes. I think the key for me was to really see who would I be without that belief and uh, the attachment yeah. to blame as well. That, that was quite key for me, to see that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining us, and thank you very much for watching Conscious TV. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. <laughs>